Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. It's, it's, it's good. I, I don't know what kind of winter we're having right now, I, whether it's dogwood winter or some other kind, but it's amazing how it gets cold and hot and hot, hot and cold. I know a person like that. <laughs> uh, today, today I want to talk about Aristotle, and you might reasonably ask why you, you might reasonably ask, why would you want to talk about Aristotle, who was the first in the series of philosophers that we talked about? Why would you want to talk about them last? A and there's a reason for it, believe it or not. Uh, the reason is that Aristotle is the most sensible moral philosopher who ever lived. He's got his own problems, but he's sensible. I mean by sensible, he is a person who takes seriously living in society. Uh, he, he's not like Nietzsche, off thinking about what it would be good or how it would be good to create a self for oneself. He's, he's a philosopher who knows that we live in society, and if we want to live well, there are certain things that we have to do, certain things that we have to keep in mind, certain things that we have to adjust to, certain things that we simply have to adopt, adapt to. And that's, uh, that's why I want to talk about Aristotle last. And I promise not to strip beyond this. Uh, but I will, as you know, I'll get hot in a minute. Uh, Aristotle uh, is a uh, student of Plato's uh, and a teacher of Alexander the Great. Uh, his great book, Nicomachean Ethics, uh, is written for his son Nicomachus. Uh, this is how you live well. The, the theme is always living well or flourishing. That's really what human beings want to do. That's what they need to do. And Aristotle takes seriously the idea uh, that we are organisms living in nature, that um, we are not immortal souls, although he's got a lot to say about the soul but that we're not immortal souls uh, who will uh, uh, f go to another place. Uh, we are regular organisms of a very special sort, but regular organisms with a lifespan, with uh, seasonal perfections. Uh, I, I, I love that idea, and I'll talk about that. Seasonal perfections, so that there's certain things appropriate for children, and certain things appropriate for adults, and certain things appropriate for older folks. And, all of those things you, you can do well. And if you do all of those things well, you will have lived a good life. And uh, that's what it's all about. So a life cycle, the notion of a life cycle, which unfortunately we seem to have forgotten. It's probably the only thing that we forgot out of Aristotle. But uh, we, 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 we definitely forgot how important it is uh, to be appropriate and proper to a certain stage of life. I, uh, uh, Shirley and I have a friend, uh, a poet, who, uh, you, you know what it's like for somebody, for a musician, to be just one note behind the band? Just, <laughs> <laughs> he always, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Well, this is, this is a wonderful guy, but you know, he started dating undergraduates uh, when he was 35, and uh, then thought about marriage when he was 60. Uh, but he thinks slowly, and, and so he's still not wed, but he's thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have children, and so on. Just a, a little bit behind and ever more behind. Uh, there is a certain value in uh, doing what's to be done at a certain stage of life. It's, 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 it, it, and, and, and if you don't do it right, you know, there's something, there's something gross and grotesque about, about missing out. Okay, so, so what's the fundamental assumption? The fundamental assumption, as I indicated, uh, that human beings are regular organisms in nature, uh, and being in nature and being regular organisms, they have a lifespan uh, which they can occupy by doing the right things or the wrong things. They can make the right choices or the wrong choices, and they will suffer for it if they make the wrong choice, and they will flourish if they make the right. Okay, that's simple enough, that's no nonsense. 
Uh, most of the concepts that Aristotle uses are common sense concepts, but not because they were common sense in his day. He literally invented common sense for us. Now that sounds weird, but for instance, the, the notion of actuality and potentiality. These, are, these two notions are notions that Aristotle invented. They didn't exist before. A potentiality, which means you put a seed in the ground and it actualizes itself. It, it, all you got to do is a little ground, a little bit of water, up it comes. That notion of, of the natural trajectory of things uh, is Aristotle's contribution. And, and that's not the only one by any means. Okay. So uh, once you've got this idea that human beings are uh, natural organisms, uh, you'll also have one idea in addition to that uh, that will lead you in the direction that Aristotle wants to go. And that is the idea that what we do is constantly at the center of our lives, that we are active creatures, that we engage in activities all the time. And he says that activity is the only thing that satisfies, that we are not passive beings, that if we were passive beings, we would forever live an inadequate existence. So activity, above all. Now, he talks a lot about virtue. But don't get the idea that when he says anything about virtue, he's talking about uh, how marvelous it is to be abstinent, or how, uh, how good it is for you not to drink too much. That's not, no, that virtue isn't that kind of thing. What he means by virtue and what the Greeks meant by virtue is simply one thing, and that is how to do things well. You are virtuous if you perform activities and do them well. Now, not any kind of activities, obviously. Uh, not killing people. No matter how good you are at killing people, that's not virtue. What, what's virtuous is that you do the activities proper to human beings, appropriate activities, and do them well. So appropriate activities performed well makes you virtuous, and in addition to that, he says, also makes you happy. Right? So happiness and virtue are in league. Happiness and virtue come to the same thing. You're virtuous on one condition. You do what's appropriate to human beings and you do it well, right? And if you're doing those things well, then you inevitably will be happy. Happiness, he says, is activity in accordance with virtue. But virtue just means excellence. That's all. Virtue is excellence. You're excellent at something, then you're virtuous at that. So uh, the simplest idea and the moment you think about it this way, you realize that, as against Kant, for instance, who comes much later, but didn't learn enough from Aristotle, uh, as, as against Kant, happiness has a vital role in the good life, number one. And, and number two, happiness and the good life and happiness and virtue are not at war with each other. Kant always thought that fulfilling our desires somehow puts us at odds with what is morally required of us. That desires and morality are always clashing. Aristotle says that's absolutely false. Our desires, when they're proper desires, if they're satisfied in the right kind of way, that's what happiness is all about. So in that connection, Aristotle distinguishes very sharply between feeling happy and being happy. It's a tremendous difference between feeling happy and being happy. Uh, feeling happy is what the uh, uh, drunkard uh, uh, manages to aim for, right? Because I feel I get up in the morning and there's no meaning to my life and it's really awful, you know, and I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. I don't feel good anyway. Let me have a drink. And pretty soon I feel happy. Right? Feeling happy, in other words, is typically and often a way of covering up the fact that you are unhappy. Right? You with me? So if, if, if I am genuinely unhappy, uh, the likelihood is that I will turn to drugs, that I will turn to recreational sex with anybody who comes along. A little bit? I think I can do I think I can. A condition of your being. It's a way in which 
your soul operates. It's really a condition of the person. And you can't say that, well, I'm happy now. Oh, well, I was happy then, but I'm not happy now anymore. You can't say that. Happiness is something that suffuses your life. You, you, we might call it something like uh, the satisfaction of knowing that you're on the right trajectory. The satisfaction of knowing that things are going well for you. The satisfaction of knowing that you are the kind of person you want to be. And that things are turning out well. Right? Things are turning out well. Everything is OK. You, you, you know that feeling. You, know, you, you have that illusory, momentary feeling when you think about your children and they haven't brought you any problem today. You say, ooh, things are going well. Uh, then the next day, something else comes up. Uh, so uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. But what Aristotle is saying is distinguish sharply between being happy and, and, and feeling happy. Maybe, he says, maybe you can't ever tell if a person was happy until he's dead. Now, that's an odd thing to say, but here's the context in, in which he puts it. He says, uh, there is uh, the great Trojan War when the Greeks attacked Troy. And uh, uh, Priam, the, uh, the, the king of Troy, had this beautiful little kingdom and had lovely children. He was well loved by his subjects. Everything was going well for him. And then the Greeks attacked, and everything fell apart. And he died an ignominious death, uh, a Priam did, and, uh, and his children were killed. Awful things happened. So was he happy or wasn't he? Aristotle says, maybe, maybe we can't tell until the very end of life. And then we can look back on life and say, was this really a good life or wasn't it? Well, that may be overstating it. But at any rate, uh, when you're talking about happiness, you've got to talk about a chunk of time. Uh, weeks, months, years, but most important, a kind of uh, purposiveness, uh, a, a sort of plan that we devise for ourselves. Now, there was a great American philosopher by the name of Charles Sanders Peirce. I, I always add, probably the only authentic American philosophical genius. A genius, no question about it. Uh, Peirce said uh, something like this that to be a person, to be a person, he says, not just to be happy, but to be a person, is to be a moving teleology. A moving teleology, teleology means purposiveness. Huh? A moving teleology, a, a developmental teleology, really means that you make plans for your life, and because you're a smart person, you adjust those plans as you move along. And that's what we all do. A developmental teleology simply means the plans must be adjusted, but life is no good unless you have some plans, unless you have something to look forward to, unless you have something that you can say, if I did that, I'd be all right. I'd really be satisfied. Well, that's the same idea in Aristotle. You've got to have that trajectory. You have to have that adjustable life plan. So not a life plan that's rigid, I start, you know, I, I, I have some kids like that um, uh, who, who say, well, I'm going to be a physician. They come into Vanderbilt and say, I'm going to be a physician. Uh, what kind of physician? Oh, he's, he's going to be a specialist in ankles. <laughs> I, said, I, I said, there's great need for that. Everybody has got two of them. And, uh, uh, but that's what he, he already knows. And if he gets derailed from that, he's going to be miserable. So if you're going to be a real happy person, really a happy person, You've got to go ahead and relax, make your plans, adjust them as necessary, so long as you've got plans, so long as you've got movement. So happiness is a condition of the human soul. Now, what is the soul? This is, this is a word that's got all kinds of religious connotations for us. Not at all religious for Aristotle and the Greeks. The soul, he says, is simply the internal mechanism of giving us life. In other words, he, as he puts it, the moving principle of the body. Here is somebody who is uh, dead. And here is somebody who is looking at the dead person. What's the difference between them? Come on in. What's the difference between the, the person stretched out as a 
dead body, a corpse, on the one hand, and on the other hand, somebody looking at it. There's only one difference. In the one case, there is no soul. In the other case, there's a soul. What does soul mean? One more time, it's nothing else but the principle of motion in living things. Now, the shocking idea that Aristotle adds here is that when you've got a soul, you're not unique. Animals have souls also. Even broccoli, he says, <laughs> has soul, has a soul. Because soul, yeah, broccoli moves. I don't mean from here to there, but broccoli moves like this, growing. So growing is an activity of the soul. So is motion. I mean, getting up and going as dogs do. So is thinking which human, human beings do. All of these are activities of the soul, and anybody who's got spontaneous motion of any kind, spontaneous growing, has got a soul. Okay? So you, you might look at it this way. You might say, well, broccoli, I like to talk about broccoli, uh, <laughs> broccoli has movement in the sense of growth, taking in nourishment and growing. That's what broccoli does. Uh, dogs do all that broccoli does. Right? They, they take in nourishment, plenty of it, and they grow. But they also have, as Aristotle says, two more things. One, they move about. And in order to move about, they need perception. So they have perception and motion. Notice, the animal soul, therefore, is more encompassing than the vegetable soul, or the vegetative soul, as Aristotle puts it. And then there are human beings who do everything that broccoli does. We take in nourishment. Where's my coffee? <laughs> well, there's not much nourishment. Then there is um, um, nourish, take in nourishment, and you grow. But you also, as animals do, move about and perceive things. And you do something that's uniquely human, and that is you think. You think. You make plans. Dogs don't make plans for three weeks from now. They don't say, I'll meet you here three weeks from now at four in the morning. Uh, human beings do. Right, so, so really, everything living has a soul. And, and, and everything living has a soul that seeks fulfillment, that wants to do well, that, that aims at improving itself satisfying itself, or rendering actual what is potential in it. OK, rendering actual what is potential. You get that language. That's good Aristotle language. <laughs> rendering potential, rendering actual what's potential in it is another way of saying uh, we've, got, uh, uh, we've, we've got all kinds of things that we could do. We make sensible choices about that. And then we accomplish it. The notion of accomplishing something that you can do. And you don't accomplish it because simply you can do it, but you accomplish it because it's part of this life plan that you've got for yourself. OK, now, I, I'm told that we're not asking questions until later. Uh, uh, am I? Let me ask you a question. I, is this clear so far? Is there, is there anything that's, uh, that's shockingly uh, awful? No? OK, good. Then I can drink some coffee. All right. So Aristotle says, keep always in mind that you're an organism. And an organism consisting of various organs is always in a position where it can do what's right or do or fail to do. He says, human beings have a tendency to do the right thing. Why is it that we have a tendency to do the right thing? This is, it, to me, that, that is a shocking idea because we see ourselves in such miserable light for the most part. You know, we view ourselves as sinners, not just through original sin, but through not so original things that we do. Um, it's just terrible how we, how we think that we're awful. And, and also, let me tell you that we, we tend to think awful thoughts about ourselves as Americans. I mean, I, I'm very proud of the fact that something very good happened uh, uh, with those pirates. I mean, I don't want anybody dead, but when they wish others dead, then they ought to be dead themselves. And, and, and there's reason to be proud of that. And it was done superbly well. Wow, I mean, we can do something. 
That's good. Uh, I think I think that's uh, I think that's very good. So so Aristotle says, look, uh, we have a tendency to do things right. Why? Because we were brought up right. Okay, we we were brought up right. I think that's absolutely right. If you bring up children, uh, as let's say Oliver Twist was brought up, uh, teaching him to steal from people, then obviously there's not going to be a tendency to do the th right thing. So everything Aristotle says is essentially a matter of habits, habits that you grow up with, things that you're taught in school, at home the values that you, that, that you imbibe with mother's milk. Not values of the sort where, you know, morally we've got to ask questions like, well, uh, <clears throat> are we doing the right thing? We, we, we don't ask questions like, is this the right thing? And we don't have good answers in explaining to our children why what we're proposing that they do is the right thing to do. We don't have answers to that. And we don't need answers. It's enough to say, that's not done. That's not done. That's what it means to socialize a little animal that we get coming out of the womb, <laughs> screaming with no self-control. That's what it means to, to get that little kid and, uh, and say, no, 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 we don't do that. It's not done. And some other things, you're expected to do that. Yeah, you know, you're expected to take out the garbage. Why? Well, what are you going to say to that? If you don't take it out, I'll have to take it out, and you know, you know, mutuality is such that uh, uh, you know, if 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 I take out the garbage, then you go earn the money. You say to your five-year-old, right? Uh, it's not going to work that way. So contribute, just do those things. In other words, Aristotle says morality is a matter of habit, good habits, habits which you acquire how? Look, you know the answer to that, and Aristotle gives the answer to it, and that is you acquire by doing. Huh? You acquire the habit of doing the right things by being guided by your parents in doing the right thing. And you remember that, and the next time you don't have to be guided, you just do it. So Aristotle's point is, and I think this is a very good point, we tend to do a lot of belly aching over the idea of, do, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing the wrong thing? I don't know what's right. I don't know what's wrong. That's just not right. We know a lot more about morality than we let on. We know what the de decent thing to do is, and we know what it's indecent or inappropriate or wrong or nasty or evil. We know all of that. I'm not saying on Aristotle's behalf that we know everything about morality, but we know a whole lot more than we let on. So the key is good upbringing, excellent habits, don't think about things, just do it. But not, not, not do, you know, I mean, obviously do it under the guidance of your good upbringing. And this leads, I mean, this I'm already showing you how this leads to his very famous theory of the golden mean. The golden mean, he says, is what we want to aim at. The golden mean is the heart of morality. And what we've got to develop is the tendency or the propensity, the tendency to choose the mean and not the excess or the defect. I'll explain this in a second. So, so we, 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 we should not be choosing anything but the mean. Now, what, what, does, the, what does the mean mean? Uh, it, what, what it means essentially is that there are some activities, many, many of our activities, in which we could be doing too much, or of which we can be doing too much, or we can be doing too little of it, or just right. Okay. Now, Aristotle likes the just right. But how do we know what's too much and what's too little? Well, I'll talk about that in a second. But the important idea is there is such a thing as too much. And there is such a thing as too little. And the best examples of this are moral issues. You know, moral issues are not huge issues like this. They're small issues of daily life also. How much, how much money to give? How much money would, would it be appropriate to give? Well, you can give too much. 
down to your last penny where you're, you're destitute and you walk the streets without a penny because you gave it all away to whatever. Or you can give too little. That was the charge that Mr. Turner made uh, uh, to a number of billionaires when he gave a billion dollars to the, to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, hmm? the UN. Yeah. And they said, oh, where, where are you with your billions? I'm giving mine away. I mean, that, <coughs> too much and too little, too much and too little. Look, uh, how much is the right amount of food to eat? Well, you know that you can eat too much. And, and s since I've passed the age of 30, I know that when I really like something and I eat just a little more, it's too much. You know, you, you, it sticks right here and you say, oh, God, I shouldn't have done that. You know, always stop eating before you're full. Right? At least that's, that works for me. So I know what is too much. But I also know what's too little. I mean, there's, uh, I, I've got a few students, thank God not many, who just don't believe that it's necessary to eat. Uh, you know, just, well, it's wonderful if you could live on air. It's, it's a tremendous savings. But, <laughs> but because air is relatively free, you know. But, but, but it just doesn't work that way. And unfortunately, when they do eat because they get terribly hungry, they don't want to retain it for long. So you know what I'm talking about. That's too little. Okay? And the same is true, by the way, of courage and all the other so-called virtues. What is the right amount of courage? Now, now look, you can be an idiot. You can be an absolute idiot. You are in, in um, Afghanistan in the middle of a firefight, but you feel like smoking a cigarette. So you stand up and light the cigarette right there, you know? Well, that's not bravery, right? That's not bravery. That's foolhardiness. That's too much. Or uh, you can... Uh, be totally afraid of anything and everything. I, mean, I know somebody who is afraid of germs outside, so he stays home because, of course, there are no germs there. No, <laughs> no germs there. Uh, but yeah, why be afraid of germs? They're small. <laughs> they admittedly outnumber you, but uh, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. So you can be too afraid. You can, you can be too brave. The right is somewhere in the middle. Now, now when, you, when I say, and this is an important point for Aristotle, when I say it's right in the middle, it, in the middle but depending on who you are. We, we happen to know a, a, a young woman, actually a middle-aged woman at this point, uh, who is a fifth degree black belt. And don't, didn't go to the seventh degree, didn't need to. Uh, but she knows how to kick you in the mouth in such a way that uh, uh, sh sh you will have all your teeth in one place, right in your hands. Um, and, and, if she, and if she is attacked by somebody, then uh, I think she knows how to handle the situation, so she doesn't have to be worried about going out in the evening in a dangerous place, because she knows how to protect herself. So, on the other hand, somebody who is not a fifth degree black belt, uh, Oh, uh, just an ordinary person, one of us, going out in the middle of the night in a forgotten part of Baltimore. Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't mean to pick on Baltimore, but why not? Uh, uh, you know, uh, it could be in Nashville, too, by the way. Uh, you go out, and, and, and you don't have the kind of self-defense that she's talking, that she has. Don't do it. So how brave you can be and ought to be is partly a function of who you are, what your skills are, what your circumstances are. Aristotle puts this nice, the, the best way when he talks about Milo, the wrestler. Milo, Milo, M-I-L-O. Milo, the wrestler, is apparently a, a, a great symbol of the, of the ancient world. He's a monster. He's uh, probably, he does, Aristotle doesn't say, but probably about six, eight, uh, I would imagine 350 in pounds, and nasty, strong, and hungry. How much is the right amount for Milo to eat? A lot. A lot. How much is the right amount for me to eat? Incredibly less than that. I I'll tell you a story about it, because I, I love this story, and I love the guys that were involved. Uh, football players, we were going we to have lunch actually here a few years back. 
here in um, uh, at, 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 at the place upstairs. And uh, I was late, as I sometimes am. And by the time I got there, this guy who was about Milo's size <laughs> is sitting there, and he said, and he's finished eating. And I say, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't realize I was that late. Oh no, 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 you're not late. Uh, I said, okay. Well, I said, look, will you wait for me while I go and, and eat and get some get some food? Oh no, no, no. He says, I'll go with you. And so he comes with me, and he has a large lunch. Second. We sit down, I eat, and he eats, and he eats, and he eats. <laughs> and at the end of it, we have a nice conversation. I was a philosophy major, actually. A nice conversation. And at the end of it, I say, well, let's leave. I said, OK. He said, you, you go ahead. I think I'll stay for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> the right amount for that guy was not the right amount for me. All right. So. So how do we know what the right amount is in anything? Or how, how, how about the, you know, the golden mean? It's like this. Here are all the things that you could do. Right? Of all the things that could be done, only a certain limited number are proper to human beings. All right? Like what you're going to eat and how much you're going to eat. You will not be able to eat 800 pounds at one sitting. No matter what. That's not, it could be eaten, but it would be an elephant doing it, or a mammoth, but not, not a human being. So what is appropriate of all the things possible is limited by the fact that we're human. One. Two, it's limited also by what is accepted in our society. OK? Um, in some societies, women are expected to be fat, or shall I say, well endowed, corpulent. Uh, I, apparently, Egypt is, I haven't been to Egypt, but Egypt is said to be such a society where women, if they put on a little extra weight, indicate um, uh, that, they, that they're of a better class, that, uh, that this is a, that they, they've got money. All right, so, so there are ones like that. That is not a favorite way to be in our society. I mean, people. There's the epidemic. They talk about the epidemic of, uh, of people being overweight. But actually, I look around, and I'm trying to find a fat person, but I don't see anybody. All right, so we're very cautious about that. Here's what's appropriate to human beings. Here's, appropriate to what's, appro what, here's what's appropriate to a member of our society, OK? Not Egyptian society, not ancient Greek society, our society. And then, in addition to that, within that range, here's what's appropriate for me. So self-knowledge is crucial for Aristotle. Self-knowledge takes the form of know what it means to be a human being. Know what it means to be a member of your society. And know what it means to be specifically you and not somebody else. And if you can find out what these three things are, one more time, what it means to be human, what it means to be a member of our society, what it means to be you. If you find these three, you will know what the appropriate mean is for your activities. If you have little money, you can't give away billions. Right? That's knowledge of you. People do give away billions, but that's not me. Right? And I couldn't do it. And it's not appropriate to do that for me. Uh, and the same is true, and he goes down the list of virtues. In fact, there's a whole book and a half of, of uh, b book means a chapter, a chapter and a half of Aristotle's uh, Nicomachean Ethics, in which he explains concerning a number of these virtues, the number of these activities, um, what's appropriate and what isn't. And it's not difficult to tell. All it takes is a little bit of thinking and a lot of self-knowledge. OK, still OK? OK, well, let, me, let me drive on and, uh, and say something more about that. Here is the problem. Right away, there's a problem. There's always a problem in moral philosophy. The problem is that Aristotle is talking about adjusting to your society. 
So what the values of your society are will determine, to con or ought to determine to a considerable extent, what you will do, right? You have to adjust. This is a problem because, for instance, in Aristotle's day, slavery was an everyday event. So you just say, well, in our society, we've got slavery. That's bothersome. But then let me, let, me, let me just talk to you for a minute about why this is not completely crazy and why it's not completely immoral. The key is for human beings to flourish. The key is for human beings to live well. Are you going to be able to live well without objective conditions of that, living, of, of that life? objective conditions. And Aristotle says, if you don't have the objective conditions of living well, in other words, of happiness, you will not be happy. Not everyone can be happy. Now that's bothersome. That is even more bothersome when he says the following. He says, in order to be happy, you have to adjust to your society. Yes, by all means. But you also need friends. You can't be happy without friends. Moreover, you need money. Moreover, you need an intact body. Moreover, you need luck. You know, you could have, you, you, you could have been dead this morning. You came in, a crash, you're gone. You could have been gone at 18. Luck. Right? And finally, he says, you have to have decent looks. Decent looks. Well, you know, when I first read this, I said, this son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I meant it. And I meant it. Good looks, a part of morality. Well, imagine somebody supernaturally ugly. Man, imagine somebody who lacks bilateral symmetry. Okay, so, so, you know, uh, huh, this is perfectly okay. The other one is missing, that part, of, or or is a large sponge. Do you know you know what I'm talking about? Somebody so ugly, uh, a Medusa head, with snakes crawling in it, but actually Medusa head is normally depicted as a rather pretty woman. <laughs> now imagine. If, if, imagine all kinds of awful things, like, for instance, wearing your kidney on top of your head. Now, now, what would that be like? And particularly what comes out of there would be dripping down, right? Now, now just, just, just imagine for a minute, what would life be like? Would you like to be friends with that person? No. Would you give a job to that person? Right? Would you? Well, no, obviously. You know, you just have to have at least decent looks, right? Or an awful good cosmetologist. <laughs> that helps too. Okay, so, so, so number, you, you gotta have the looks. You, you know, if you don't have money, you can't go to Hawaii. Ho going to Hawaii is a very good activity. You miss out on a lot of things. You may not have enough money for, for food, no good. You, it's difficult to flourish without the objective conditions of happiness. The very idea that not everybody can be happy is a shocking idea, but you know it's true. You know it's true. Because some people actually make themselves unhappy. They can't stand the idea of being happy. So, but, but some other people will have to be, take heroic measures. Uh, we had recently this, this terrible case of a woman in, uh, in Vanderbilt Hospital. I think I may have mentioned this. Uh, uh, a horsewoman, early 40s, falls off the horse, is paralyzed, neck down, and uh, lives that way for two to three years. At the end of which time, she just decides she does not want to live that way for the rest of her life and, her, and terminates her existence. All right, now, now think about it for a second. Could you be a happy person if you were paralyzed from the neck down? Happy. I don't mean could you put up with it. Maybe you could put up with it. I don't mean could, would you have a couple of good days or at least a good half hours from time to time. Yeah, you could. Uh, 
But it wouldn't be a good life. It wouldn't be a happy life. It wouldn't be a satisfying life. It just, it's just, no. All right, so, so what, Aristotle, what Aristotle says is you've got to have the objective conditions, and a central objective condition of happiness is that you fit well into society. If you don't fit well, <coughs> and we know what that means, not to fit well. It's the Unabomber or somebody who is utterly unhappy or just doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't want to be a part of life, our common, our social life. Yeah, people like that aren't happy. Okay. So, so I think that's right. So Aristotle then is of the opinion that if you have the tendency or the propensity or the probability of choosing the mean, and you keep on doing that, and you have the objective conditions that make it possible for you to be a happy person, you will be a happy person. You, you won't live forever. But you can look back on your life and say it was a pretty good run. And that's good enough as far as Aristotle is concerned. All right, now I wish we could ask some questions, but uh, if you tell me that we're not in trouble, then I'll continue and then we'll concentrate the questions at the end. Does that sound all right? Okay. How do we know, how do we know what's the right amount of killing? So people argued against Aristotle. He said, look, Aristotle, you say that every kind of activity has a too much and a too little and a just right. So how much killing is just right? Not more than eight people a year. Right? If you kill more than eight, that's too much. Eight is about right. Zero would be a grave flaw. No, 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 no. Aristotle says, look, it doesn't work that way. Some activities are already excesses or defects. So killing persons, of course there's no such thing as killing too many, killing too few, just right. Killing is already an excess, namely an excess of aggressiveness. Okay? And similarly, uh, for all those activities that we think are inappropriate activities, some of them or all of them are already excesses or defects. So not every action, not every kind of action, has a too much, a too little, and just right. right. Some actions are already too muches, and some actions are already too littles, and there's no golden mean for them. Okay? It's a good answer. I think it's a good answer by Aristotle. But now, let me, let me see if I can go on and try to talk to you about something that's of great significance to me personally, and uh, of, of considerable significance to Aristotle. Aristotle realizes that the great enemy of human life, because we're reflective people, that the great enemy of human life is time. It's not just that we have not enough of it, but also that no matter how much you have, it's destructive. Time is destructive and stands in the way of that moment of perfect fulfillment. If you could have a moment of perfect fulfillment, time would not destroy it. So Aristotle asks himself, what is there that we could do? What is there to do to somehow overcome the destructive power of time? Now let me, let me be quite specific as to what I mean by the destructive power of time. Uh, suppose you decide to build a building or a house. The first stage of that, of course, after you buy the lot, preferably, uh, the first stage of it is to dig a big hole. And, and then, and then uh, you uh, pour the foundations. And then you put up the first floor. And then you put up the, and so on, all the way till the roof is on, and then you finish the inside. Now notice what's happening. This is a process, Aristotle says, this is a process in which uh, when you first start digging, the processing is incomplete because you haven't put the roof on yet. There's a lot of steps to cover. So <coughs> incomplete at the beginning. Now, when you start digging, when you, when you start pouring the foundations, you already quit digging the hole. 
So that's a matter of the past. But you still haven't put up the first floor. You put up the first floor now. And already you are no longer digging and you're not pouring the foundations and you haven't yet put on the roof. So this is a process that is incomplete in every one of its moments, in every part of it. Okay, you with me? Incomplete means not really satisfying. I'm still wanting to finish the damn thing. And the closer I get to finishing, all I've got left is the memory. That's not enough. I'd like to have a kind of fulfillment, Aristotle says, a kind of fulfillment that has no time in it, that doesn't make, leave me yearning for the future and the past. That's what I want. Is there such a thing? And he says, yes, there is. This he calls activity. Activity, he says, is the momentary. It's momentary, but complete. The momentary enjoyment of contemplation. Now, what he means by contemplation, this is, this is a tough word. What he means by contemplation is thinkingly enjoying. Thinkingly enjoying timeless things. What I mean by thinkingly enjoying, what he means by thinkingly enjoying timeless things is ideally, of course, he's a highbrow. Contemplating the laws of nature. Laws of nature never change, he thinks. They never change, he thinks. So if I could just contemplate them, in other words, wrap my mind around them. All right, that's difficult. How about uh, a really beautiful equation? Two plus two equals four. That's a beautiful equation. You know, we, we, we think it's nothing, but it's not nothing. It's wonderful because it's, it's such a glorious demonstration of the meaning of the symbol of plus and and. Now, I know it, it takes a little something to get high on the idea of 2 plus 2 equals 4. Right? But, 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 you know, just think about that for a minute. Think about that. And, and it's just, well, I'll make it easier because Aristotle wants to be highbrow, but I don't, I'm not highbrow. Uh, what about momentary enjoyment of anything that really appeals to you so that you are totally absorbed in it. Now, my favorite is, during the summer, watching water run. You know, you, 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 you put the hose on, and you see how the water goes this way and that. You know? and, 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 and it's wonderful how it does. And I love the play of wood. You, know, you take a good piece of veneer or something, and, and it is fabulous, or, or flooring, wood flooring. It's fabulously complex and, and so wonderfully pleasing to the eye. That's not quite Aristotle because that's too commonplace for him. He, he does want this on a more elevated level. I'll settle for a less elevated level. It's the difference between going to walk from here to Kirkland Hall to get there to see the dean, number one. Number two, going for a walk. See, the point of going for a walk is that it has no purpose beyond itself. Now, if you're going for a walk because you're saying, with every step I'm putting on muscle, if that's what you're doing, you miss the whole point. That's not what it's about. You're not wanting to put on muscle. What you're wanting to do is walk, and you'll see the dogwoods. And, and if you could only somehow, and I say this seriously, I do this, you get into the dogwood tree, you know? You get in so, so that you're completely surrounded by the white. Alas, it doesn't smell. I mean, it, dogwood ought to have a fabulous intoxicating scent to it, but it doesn't. But the white is intoxicating. Ah, like that. That's activity. It's a, it's, it has no purpose beyond itself. It is, as we say, an end in itself. It's valuable in and of itself. You don't need anything else. If you don't do anything else all day, stand next to or inside a dogwood tree. Now, today. And then you'll understand what it means to be utterly and timelessly satisfied. Admittedly for a moment. Right? So, so you don't actually extricate yourself from time. You don't become everlasting or eternal. But the moment is eternal. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you're with me, you understand what I'm saying. The moment becomes eternal because 
you require nothing. You're totally self-forgetful. And Aristotle says that is what he, that, that is intellectual virtue. In other words, that is contemplating, that is enjoying, <coughs> that is participating in the beauty of the world in a way that leaves no dissatisfaction and no worry about, well, tomorrow we may die. Of course tomorrow we may die. Maybe we die today. But that doesn't matter at all in this moment of self-forgetful satisfaction. So Aristotle says the highest virtue that human beings can, can engage in, the highest activity, is this kind of contemplation. But it's not the total activity. <coughs> the total activity, the total satisfaction of a human being is a combination of intellectual virtue, and that means contemplation, this absorption in the moment, and also moral action. When you got the two of them together, You've got a happy human being. And a human being who, in an odd kind of way, in, in a way that's as satisfying as we'll ever get, manages to transcend time. Aristotle and the Greeks did not believe in infinity. They, they, they don't like the idea of a life going on forever. So they don't think that there is a condition beyond this. Um, they really believe that death is terminal. And they may be right. We don't know. But they certainly believe that and believe it deeply. That belief enables them to see their lives, and Aristotle is a good example of this, enables them to see their lives as somehow satisfying as a whole without the need for extending it and extending it and extending it. Let me put it another way. Uh, I think in our churches there is a very unfortunate identification of the everlasting with the eternal. We just kind of mix it up. But that's not, that's not good thinking. And Aristotle makes that point very clearly. Uh, the everlasting is that which goes on and on and on and on and on in time. So if we're immortal, we're kind of everlasting. We never die. Or we die, but we come back. <coughs> That's not eternal. Eternal is to be utterly transcending time, going past time. The way you do that is exactly the way in which I suggested, namely by taking that moment of absorptive activity where you don't think about anything. There's no future. There's no past. Understand, of course there's a future and of course there's a past. Ten minutes from now, it's over. You come out of the dogwood bush. It's a little bit crazed, but come out anyway. So of course there's a, but, but at the moment, there's no future and there's no past. There's only the total satisfaction of doing what you're doing, being who you are. That's ultimate. That's ultimate satisfaction for Aristotle. And I think it's ultimate satisfaction for all of us. It's, it's very, very good advice. In other words, if you don't stop and smell the flowers, isn't that a terrible way of reducing it? But if you don't stop and smell the flowers, you're really missing something, like you're missing that moment of eternity in your life. Eternity is a qualitative dimension of life. It's not a quantitative on and on and on. One more time. It's a qualitative dimension of life. It's not an ongoing quantitative matter. Doesn't matter how long life lasts. You can get absorbed in the beauty of it at any time. Let me, let me stop, and I will say more things if you ask me. <laughs> you don't ask me, won't say a word. Yes, ma'am. Okay. As loud as you can, and then I'll repeat your question. Okay. That's okay. Oh, wait, wait a minute. We're supposed to wait for microphone? Yes, yes, ma'am. The microphone is coming. Okay, good. The, the lady over there. I would say that's okay for people. It's for it's like not most not of us. Or for What's more important, the microphone or to have it on? <laughs> I'll repeat the question. Oh, come on. What's the I'll just say the question and I'll repeat it. But the problem is, 
what about those people who were living in slavery? What about those people who now don't have the opportunity to get into adulthood or should enjoy it? What about the people who uh, were living in slavery in Aristotle's day and who didn't have a chance to do this? Well, two answers to that. One is anybody can engage in this absorptive, self-absorptive activity, even slaves. No question about that. But, but I think the downside of Aristotle's, and I was waiting to, for you to ask that question in order to be able to say what I'm about to say. The downside of Aristotle, and there's a great downside, is that you do have to adjust to your society and you can't rock the boat. Now, if you're going to be a reformer, you, know, you may achieve some results, but you won't be happy. Right? People will be spitting at you. Uh, people will say, that troublemaker, uh, they, you won't get a good job. They'll fire you from places. People will talk about you behind your back. All kinds of nasty things. You'll, 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 you'll have comrades at arms, but no friends. Okay, so, so Aristotle is right that to be happy, you got to, you know, hang out with everybody. You just do what everybody does. But I think it's morally questionable. And he doesn't have any, anything to say about when to initiate reform. That's a very serious issue. We are reform-minded. We, don't always, success, we don't, always, don't always succeed in our reforms. But, but at least we have a moral platform from which, you know, a little higher, a little higher, and now, now I've got a platform from which I can say, no, you can't do that. He doesn't have that platform. But he's happy. That's something. Yes? Uh, for Aristotle, the community is a relatively small uh, unit. Uh, today, we have a global community. Well, I'll tell you something. That, that gives, me an, uh, gives me a chance to say something uh, very nice about Nashville. Um, Aristotle's ideal community is 10,000. That's what he says, roughly 10,000 people. I think that's a little too low. That's a little too low. But I think Nashville is still a size, you're talking about maybe less than a million people realistically, although we blow it up to be more. Uh, uh, Nashville is, is, is the right size because of what? Because if you go about 6 o'clock or 6.15 in the morning to the Starbucks in Green Hills, then you will see a large uh, black automobile pull up and outbounds the, the governor of the state. And it's a fact. And, uh, and, and people do a double take, shit, what's he doing here at this hour? Uh, but there he is, and he doesn't send his driver in for a cup of coffee, but lines up with the rest of us peons. Right? And people go up to him, I've, I've seen this, a woman started going whoa, 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 at him, and he was taken aback, and, and he was handling the question and says, yes, I'll take care of that, and so on. In other words, there's still the possibility of a human scale where you get to know people who are important people in the community, and you get to know the folks running for office, and you, and you have enough variety so that you can choose among physicians, etc. Uh, but I'm not idealizing Nashville, but I'm saying is this is about a human-sized community. And it's, it's a million, not, not 10,000. Um, of course, our community is a collection of communities, uh, so that uh, one side of town is not the same as the other side of town. That's also true. But at least there's some side of town that you can belong to. So uh, now when it comes to the genuinely global side or um, the worrisome global side of life, I'd, I'd say um, don't go there. <laughs> you lose footing. You, you know, if you, if, you're, if, you're, if you see yourself as, as somehow a part of a global culture which 
is doesn't really exist yet. I think you're I think you're gonna have a lot of trouble. Uh, there's there's point to the old uh, line that you see on so many cars, you know, think globally, act locally. I think I think that acting locally is is Aristotle's advice. I think it's good advice. Two questions and that's all. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> huh? Alexander's life uh, portrayed what he expected? Not at all. <laughs> did, did Alexander, is uh, Aristotle's student, uh, did Aristotle's uh, views uh, influence, adequately influence Alexander the Great? I think that this is yet another instance of a, of a teacher not succeeding. Uh, and there are plenty of instances of that. Uh, uh, Alexander was uh, an infinite seeker. I mean, he went all the way to India. I don't know why he went to India, what he lost there. Or to, uh, why, why do you have to go to India and kill people yeah, when you can kill them, kill them back home? Uh, of course, he did that too. Uh, it, it uh, you know, Eric, look, Alexander was not a happy man. Right? And so, in that sense, what Aristotle said was true, because, because Aristotle had the wrong desires and didn't know what was too much and too little. But alas, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes a teacher fails. And maybe it's not because he's a bad teacher. Maybe he's got a bad pupil, didn't do his homework. <laughs> what would the world be like if Alexander had uh, wanted to be happy? instead of emperor of the world. I don't know. It would have been different. I'd like to contemplate that. Imagine if all those people in the world who want to be king of the world, emperor, uh, were to say, I think instead of that, I'll settle down in a nice little house in a suburb and lead a happy life. You know, this would be a hell of a lot better world. Uh, yes, sir. Is there any notion of progress in Aristotle? No. He does not have the idea of, that we have of evolution. He doesn't have the idea of the evolution of human societies. The only idea of evolution he, he has is the evolution of the person uh, within the society from the obvious, namely childhood through adulthood to old age. That's all. The notion that things will be better in the future, the Greeks had the opposite idea. The golden age was way in the past. And then silver, and now we're in the middle of bronze. Right? Just, it's, it's amazing. And, and, and they, were, they were a good society, but they didn't believe that things were um, as good as they might be, or that they would be better. Boy, are we ahead of them on that one. Huh? Yeah. For some, that's right, for some actions. I was thinking, you know, just about this pirate situation. Shooting the pirates. How, you know, how that fits in with the idea of killing is never justified. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the question is, uh, uh, how does the killing of the pirate, pirates uh, fit in with... Uh, with the idea that, there's, that, that killing is already a, too much. Well, you have to draw distinctions. You know, philosophers always wiggle out of questions like that by drawing a couple of distinctions. Um, there's killing, meaning murder, and there's killing in war. In war, there is a right amount of killing, namely everybody on the other side. <laughs> right? That's about the right amount. Not too much, not too little. Right? And, and in this case, there were three guys in there who were holding an AK-47 to the captain's head, and all three are dead. And, uh, you know, I, and I, say, I say this seriously. I, I think the worst thing that we can do is to wish ill for human beings. I think that's terrible. But it's not that they didn't deserve it. It's, um, so it was about the right amount of killing, Aristotle would say. Three out of three. <laughs> Not too much, not too little. I mean, they could have killed the fourth also, but 
that guy didn't have weapons. Yeah. Yes. Uh, as in good upbringing, one, who defines what good upbringing is, and two, uh, so many children are brought up in homes in which uh, we would consider um, um, highly inappropriate, and to them, that is what they know. Therefore, Uh, can you equate that with good upbringing in that particular context? Uh, the question is, uh, who knows what good upbringing is? Uh, uh, who decides that? And uh, what about the people, children who are brought up in very questionable homes with very bad habits? And uh, uh, how, how can we, I guess, how can we condemn that? On what basis can we condemn that? Well, Aristotle's view is that on the whole, we know. Now, we sometimes pretend we don't know. But on the whole, we know what's good upbringing and what isn't. Uh, to raise your children to steal from other people, uh, not good upbringing. Now, 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 you see, but, but why wouldn't it be good upbringing? Well, of course, you can now look at it from the standpoint of how much damage it does, how much harm it does, not only, not only to the person from whom you steal, but how much, how much damage it does to the person who steals. Because sooner or later, that person will end up in jail. And once it ends up in jail, will be raped. And once they're raped, God knows what will happen. Right? All kinds of bad things. So you can look at it from the standpoint of the consequences. You can look at it from the standpoint of how inappropriate it is for somebody to take something that belongs to somebody else. So that's a kind of, uh, that's a kind of special horror. Um, now, what, what, what are we to do about, the second part of your question, what are we to do about uh, circumstances where children are raised in homes that, um, that have horrible values? Well, number one, we know they're horrible values. Right? If children are raised in a home where there's a, uh, indolent parents, uh, where there is... Uh, exposure to all sorts of depravity, uh, where the values are, are values that don't take human life and human welfare seriously. Um, if we find that, we know what to do. We get human services in there and take the children out. So there's no, what, what I'm trying to say is Aristotle doesn't think there are any secrets about these things. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. Some people don't. We ought to teach them and we ought to take their children away. Ashtar would have no qualms about that. Well, you know, just, I'm, I'm, you say, wow, but, but uh, that's what we do. That's what we do. I mean, it's, I'm, 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 if, if uh, the person who had eight at a time, uh, forget her name, uh, good to forget her name, um, the, the one who had eight, eight at a time, you know, th those children should have been taken and would have been taken, would have been taken away had it not, had it, were it not that she managed to swing some kind of a contract and she's got to be a millionaire. Uh, if, 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 if that were not the case, I think the children would be taken from her. And I think appropriately so. See, see how I, I expose myself to all kinds of opinions here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. That his argument that what? Slavery would end only when automatons didn't work, as happened with the Industrial Revolution. That's exactly right. Um, he says, that Aristotle says, uh, I should repeat the question, what about the uh, Aristotle's comment that slavery would only cease if robots did all the work? Uh, well, look, of, uh, of course. Uh, Aristotle goes so far as to say that some people are by nature slaves. By nature. They like not making decisions for themselves. And, you know, I think that's in a way sick because if you look at it from the standpoint of keeping people down on the basis of you're a natural slave, you don't want to make decisions, that's awful. But I happen to know people, and you do too, who don't like to make decisions. Right? 
who don't want to make decisions for them. I, you know, got a, any number of students who had gone in the army with the specific idea that they didn't want to make decisions for themselves. Right? So uh, does that mean they're natural slaves? No, but they're natural uh, uh, confused people who don't want to make decisions for themselves. And, uh, and of course, it's wonderful that we've got machines so human beings don't have to dig ditches and do all the horrible things that people have to do. Uh, but I, but if I, born, I think... If you're born into a society where slavery is an integral part of the system, aren't you trying to, uh, in your mental development, aren't you trying to find rational explanations that justify that condition? Sure, we, we are great rationalizers. Oh, repeat the question. Okay, the, uh, the question is, um, if you live in a society that tolerates or even uh, uh, approves of uh, slavery, is it not true that you would uh, find ways of justifying that? Uh, and of course, we do find ways of justifying whatever we do. Uh, and, well, let me just put it, let me put the issue of slavery this way. I have a highest possible opinion of Thomas Jefferson. I, I, think, I think he was a genius in many respects, a tremendously smart man, and he had no difficulty with slavery. Had no difficulty with it. He adjusted himself to the society in which he lived because he understood that even if it was inappropriate to have slavery, that's what they had. And then, of course, you move, make the next move, which is a little more questionable, beyond adjustment, and that is, uh, look, uh, uh, this is a good way to be, right? Those people are natural slaves, and we're natural thinkers. Of course, Aristotle values thinking. And you can't really be thinking unless you have a couple of people serving you food uh, <laughs> right? and working for you, right? OK. Well, hey, I'd like that, but I don't like to enslave people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that um, the uh, heads of the tribe were killing Africans and uh, the sword, you know, went all over the world during the beginning of those days. And uh, they talked about, you know, we went to the Netherlands on the issue of people referring to, uh, talked them into the tribal heads into selling them to them as slaves. And then later on, as America developed, you know, they sold them back to, to our people. And uh, so actually, uh, the, the, the point is that slavery, there's some evidence that slavery and bringing slaves to this country saved the lives of many people in Africa. Uh, and that may be, but you can't overlook the fact that it was to our benefit uh, to uh, have the labor of people who, where all we had to do was feed them and they worked their tails off. Uh, we made sure that they did. So it's, it's uh, it's, it's, it's a questionable practice, to say the least, to, make, to put it nicely. Uh, I think the very idea that a person couldn't make decisions for himself is, is so clearly anathema to me that uh, we, we really can't wrap our minds around what it would be like to have been a slave. We can't, we can't do it. Uh, but the other side of it is, I mean, there's always, let me tell you, friends, there's always another side in morality. And the other side to it is, Suppose you live in a society that permits all kinds of discrimination. We've all lived in a society that discriminated substantially and heavily against women. Yes. We've lived in that society, right? Yes. And some people think we live in the, live in the same society now, right? <laughs> uh, but but you know, but let, let me just let me just say this: uh, uh, you can't change things overnight. And we know how horrible things are in some respects at any given time. Uh, but, it's, but you can't just come in on the white chargers and say, enough of this foolishness. Let's do something else. You just can't do that. And it would be nice to do that. And if you do want to do it and you're on your white charger, be ready to be unhappy. That's right. <laughs> be ready to be unhappy. Uh, now, Before, before we quit, I want to say what a pleasure it has been 
to spend time with you. You're a wonderful audience, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Has anyone ever suggested to you that you just might be an endangered species? Well, if so, I'm protected by the government. <laughs> <laughs> we thank you so much thank you. for coming and Pleasure. being with us again. It's just, just wonderful to have you here. And thank you. And you see the kind of response that you get. You. And we, this is a certificate that we want to give. All and, right. And a token of our appreciation with a... A Aristotle. Of a bust of Aristotle. Wow. Right there. Wow. <laughs> well, he had hair and he had a beard. I like it. <laughs> Thank you.